Since World War II, the U.S. military has been sending teams of soldiers onto the battlefield with film and photography gear to document the action. These so-called combat camera teams often provide the only depictions of major military operations, and their work helps shape public perceptions. During conflict and peace and natural disasters, we tell the story. They've been called propagandists, guilty of sanitizing the realities of war on the ground. In 2003, for example, when soldier Jessica Lynch was taken prisoner by Iraqi forces, it was a combat camera team that captured her rescue by U.S. Special Operations. The Pentagon was later accused of dramatizing details of the rescue to lift waning public support for the war. In 2008, an 18-year-old recent high school graduate named Miles Lagozzi signed up for the Marines and became a combat camera videographer for his unit in Afghanistan. After his deployment in 2011, Lugosi went rogue, shooting footage that undermined official messaging, including scenes of Marines smoking hash and joking about death. After being discharged from the Marines, Lugosi compiled that footage into Combat Obscura, a new feature-length documentary that aims to show the real story of what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan. The war is, was so mismanaged, and there were so many different moving parts and so many different bureaucratic levels that they weren't really watching 18-year-old combat camera kid and where he was going and what he was filming. The film offers a horrifying but honest look at the desensitizing effects of war and the failure of American exceptionalism abroad. What did you do in the Marines? You get a camera and then you go around? Like, what were the parameters you were allowed to do? A lot of shots with the Afghan army. Because at that point in 2011 when I deployed, we were supposed to be transitioning out. Uh, obviously, yeah. <laughs> that didn't go well. So a lot of the shots that they wanted were of uh, you know, the Afghan army, working with the Afghan army, giving kids candy and, and stuff like that. They weren't too big on like actual combat. An aesthetic is kind of the wrong word, but like, what was your story sense then, or your spider sense, like that you decided this is the kind of stuff that I'm gonna go to again and again? I was sort of trying to capture what I'd seen in, in war films, like mm -hmm. Full Metal Jacket and stuff. When I started working on the film, years after I'd, I'd gotten out, I really tried to deconstruct that whole, what I was doing out there, and put it into something uh, very different. There's a lot of scenes in the movie where, you, where the guys that you're dealing with, I mean, it almost looks like a YouTube video where they're playing to the camera. How do images of war end up affecting how people act in war? And then, you know, is that a, is that a virtuous loop or is that a kind of self-defeating one? What I was was kind of like an outlet for them and even like my nickname was YouTube when I, when I was out there because they wanted to be the way that they wanted to be seen amongst themselves, not so much like how a civilian would film them. As far as like the broader issue of like what effect does imagery have, I think it's tough because a lot of this footage is already out there on these kind of war porn sites. You know, if you want to see pretty much anything, you can just Google it and find it. As far as like putting it into a feature documentary, I don't think it's been done too much in the past. I think that a lot of the documentaries, and especially news coverage that comes out, tends to sanitize it. I think with a civilian reporter, a civilian journalist, there's still kind of a barrier there that you're not going to break through. You're never going to be able to film them you know, being completely honest or joking about death the way that you see in the film and stuff like that. That's a part of military culture that can really only come from within, I think. How you doing, buddy? Another day, man. Another day. You show at uh, one point Marine smoking hash. It's kind of surprising that, I mean, it's not surprising that it's, you know, it's happening, but it's kind of surprising it's in the movie. What, what was the choice behind including that, or what was the thinking behind that? Well, it was a huge part of our deployment. You know, it was, it was a way to kind of pass the time, but also to remind ourselves that we were in a war zone, because you get, it gets so boring after a while that you're like, kind of, you get into stuck into the routine of patrol, night watch, post, you know, back and forth, back and forth, that you, you forget to look around and, and, and see that these are uh, people's homes and these are, this is a beautiful, exotic place that you're in, you know. And the people are constantly giving it to you. We would smoke weed with, we'd smoke hash with, with the locals. It was kind of that way to, like, break down the barrier of, you know, it's sort of like a universal language of, <laughs> of just, laughter and stuff like that. When you're out there, you don't, you're not really 
thinking about the bigger picture. What are we out here for? What, mm-hmm. you know, what is it like to be out here? You're just kind of living day to day and and constantly patrolling and, and just kind of worrying about your next meal, basically, and, and the guys that you're with, trying to keep them alive. Is that a callback to earlier movies? And I'm thinking of even or novels like uh, um, All Quiet on the Western Front, where the platoon it, I mean, it's it's on the, the ground, so like you don't really have that larger sense of what a mission is. We want to reflect like the emotional uncertainty of war. In, in the editing of the film, the lack of narrative and everything, we want to kind of recreate that, uh, that uncertainty and, and the experience in real time. But I think after sitting through it, you know, maybe digesting it for a while, you get a kind of broader picture of, you know, how this war was just, it, there, was no, there was no chance that it was going to work like mm-hmm. from the beginning in the long run. And is that because there was no, or at least as far as the ground soldiers understood, there was no larger objective or clear goal that was being served? I think so, yeah. And I mean, even if that goal could be achieved, like if we were to get rid of the Taliban completely, what comes after that? You're talking about regions where the people, you know, they don't even identify as Afghans. They don't have a national identity. They, they relate, they identify as whatever tribe they belong to. So, I mean, yeah, no thought really went into the end goal, what was gonna happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, after. When you were there, was it successful in getting rid of the Taliban or was it just they were rope doping They were just waiting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, you see what's happening now. Right. They would shoot at us from, you know, hundreds of meters away. And then as soon as a helicopter or air support came in, they'd be gone. And you never saw them. I mean, you rarely saw who was shooting. Now that we've handed it over to the Afghan army mm-hmm. and we're not actively working with them or patrolling with them, they're just getting absolutely, you know, massacred because they don't have their air support, they don't have our weapons, they don't have the technology, they don't have the training, and the Taliban is literally overrunning their bases, you know, like getting hand-to-hand, getting that close. You got hurt in the middle of this and the camera turns on you. What is it like to get Uh, wounded (laughs) and then how do you deal with that? I mean, it sucks, you know, first. But um, like the whole time I was out there leading up to that point when I was hit, I think I had this air of invincibility and the camera kind of added to that. You know, I just wanted to film as much combat as I could and everything, you know, I was obsessed with filming everything. And after that, I was kind of like, you know, it really gave you perspective mm. that these people are, you know, trying to kill you personally. And it became very, it felt very detached before and then it became just incredibly personal in that moment there. What were the extent of your injuries? Oh, I just, I mean, it was, I got a piece of shrapnel it, it luckily it went through my helmet strap, mm. so it didn't dig that deep in. It's very superficial. Obviously, this is the only war that you've been in, but it's a volunteer uh, force. Is that better or worse for morale? Do you think? I've thought about that a lot. You know, I mean, on the one hand, you're getting a lot of kids that want to serve their country, mm. and they maybe actually do believe in what they're doing. But then you get a lot of kids who didn't get into college. You know, they're getting basically bribed to go serve their country to get money for for school, which is insane, that you actually have to go get shot at in another country in order to afford college is ridiculous. Then there's other kids like me who kind of wanted to experience war just because it was something that we had reified in our minds as something that, you know, you become a man by going to war, you, uh, you learn something by going. If there was mandatory service, it might actually... <laughs> you might actually see less wars because it would bring the wars home to pretty much every citizen. I mean, if we're, if we're a country that's going to be perpetually at war, then I think everyday citizens should be acknowledging that, and that's maybe one way to, to do it. The war in Afghanistan now has been going on for, I guess it's coming up on 18 years, right? It'll be in the, in the fall, uh, assuming it's still going on. Did you get a sense when you were there that the people had different feelings about it in the kind of, in the first three or five years in the second, et cetera, or has it just kind of blurred into a, um, you know, just kind of a fact of nature? Do you mean American people? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, I think it's just kind of background noise at this point, you know? People still thank you for your, for your service, but it's often kind of frustrating because it's, I'm not sure what they're thanking us for. Do people actually feel that us being in Afghanistan and somehow, uh, made us safer here? Mm. I don't know if people actually think that. I don't think that. And I don't think in the long run it really served the Afghan people that well either. But, you know, it's a very complicated thing. How do you There's Afghans that that want us there, that want us to stay there. The Afghan army is like, where did they, where did you go? 
we've left us out here to, to just get slaughtered. You talked about deconstructing combat as a reality. What's the big hope that you have in, in making this movie and bringing it to an audience? I think we're at a point, as, I mean, as a veteran especially, where we want accountability, not just for the military industrial complex, but for us, mm -hmm. the kids that were out there too, you know? If we can give people a sense of that through this kind of, this difficult film, which is very difficult, uh, then I think we've, we've done our job. And if it makes a kid who's thinking about joining the Marines, you know, if it gives them some hesitation, then I think that's good too. Do you feel like America, you know, is becoming more realistic about what it can accomplish through war? I hope so. <laughs> mm. I'm a little concerned because it's all special forces now, and we're in these, you have special these small units that are that are all over the world in almost every country now, mm -hmm. and there's no coverage whatsoever. I mean, there's not even combat camera that's with them. There's no civilian embeds. There's nothing because it's all classified. Everything they're, they're doing is just being conducted in the shadows, and that's not to say that what they're doing is bad. A lot of times they're just training local militias and mm -hmm. stuff, but we should know what they're doing. We should know who they're training. We should know why they're training them should know where they are. And why don't we? I mean, it's, it's because, classified, but it's I mean, classified. why is it classified? Because I mean. they're special forces. Mm -hmm. So JSOC, the Joint Special mm -hmm. Operations Command, everything that they do is classified. Mm -hmm. But right now, they happen to be doing everything. Mm -hmm. They happen to be fighting in almost every country. And so it's very uh, disconcerting that there's absolutely no coverage mm -hmm. of, of these guys and what they're doing. I think Afghanistan is going to be the last actual on-the-ground troop war. Mm -hmm you know, like regular troops out there in mass bulk. What is your opinion of the war now that you've made the film and you've been able to, I mean, because you shot all of this in 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. put it together, it's out. How has this process changed your attitude towards the war in Afghanistan? I mean, going into making it and having, the dis having some time to, to look back at all the memories and then the footage that I had, I definitely started becoming more critical of, of our involvement and what the ultimate end goal was, why we were there in the first place. And just reading about the history of, of the country and the region, you know, I had no, I couldn't even point out Afghanistan on a map before I went out there, you know? That's not a good thing. So just educating myself and then going through the footage and um, being more candid and honest with what I included, mm. it started to make me more critical, but more empathetic at the same time. In a way, I'm trying to humanize the troops by showing the, their faults, you know what I mean? And that's how you kind of, I think that's the best way to, to humanize someone. Mm -hmm.